My name is Charles Zach. Um, I'm a long time uh, uh, gun enthusiast like probably everybody in here. My, uh, my home gun club is Civil Adair Silverdale. I've been shooting there for almost 40 years or something like that. Uh, I used to sight in my rifle on this place is way back when, so you know, I know the area. I don't recognize anybody in the crowd here except for a couple people, but uh, anyway. Um, so the topic that we're here to discuss as Dave went on about was the 43rd general election, the federal election that's coming up on Monday, and how the outcome of that election is gonna affect us as gun owners, okay? So, but I think before we talk about what's gonna happen, I think let's just uh, go back a little bit in time and just sort of recap um, and revisit some of the legislation that sort of piled up over time to see how we got here. So when we look back at the history of things, I mean, Canada has always had gun control in some form or another. Okay, so uh, back in the 19th century, we, we, had, uh, we had gun control. Um, you know, it wasn't until the 60s that things started to escalate a little bit, right? We had, uh, in the 60s, the firearm categories of restricted and prohibited were created. And, uh, you know, we had a situation where the state gave itself uh, the power of classifying guns by order of counsel, and also gave itself powers of search and seizure to, to actually take guns away from people that were deemed to be you know, a public security threat or a threat to themselves. In the 19, in 1970s, uh, Bill C-51 was enacted, which prohibited all the, uh, you know, the fully automatic guns, the real military assault rifles, if you want to put it that way, and uh, formalized the FAC, the, uh, the Firearms Acquisition Certificate uh, System. Um, I came from that era, and I can. I just want to sort of elaborate on what Dave was saying that when I got my FAC, I'm sure everybody recognized that. I basically went to the police station, filled out my application, and the next day, I had my FAC. It was simple as that. They did a background check on you, make sure you weren't, you know, a felon or a criminal or something like that, and bingo and bingo, that was it, right? So, so when I got that, <laughs> just a funny story. Um, you know, I had guns all my life. My father had guns, and uh, our high school had our high school had a uh, shooting club way back when. So I remember getting on the bus with my dad's 22, right, uncased, right. I had bullets in my pocket and everything else, right, with my books and everything else. Nobody died at night, right. Went to school, put it inside the locker, right, locked it up and everything else. After school, we, you know, we had to wait for the football team to get off the field. We rolled out the hay bales and we shot for an hour and then we went up, right. What happened? <laughs> so there was no harm done, no mass shootings, no harm. There was nothing going on. Anyway, I digress. So the 1990s rolled around, and this is when uh, things started to accelerate in terms of stricter gun controls. Uh, C-17 uh, was ushered in, which uh, basically brought in stricter controls on paramilitary uh, firearms, high-powered guns. And uh, this is when they first brought in mandatory testing and training for, uh, for gun owners. And of course, we all remember that Bill C C68 was also created during this period. And um, I just remember my, my own reaction to this. I'm just the moose hunter at that point. I'm going, what's the big deal, right? You know, like, they're just bringing in a new thing. And meanwhile, the people in my hunting party are jumping up and down. I have to re-qualify. I've been shooting a rifle for 35 years. And I have to prove to the government again that I'm, I'm, I'm a competent, you know, firearms owner. You know, it was insulting, but it wasn't until later that I realized the depth of the deception in this, this particular legislation and where it was going to go. In 2012, C-19 uh, was, was implemented by the Conservatives, which ended the long gun registry. And they've been tap dancing on that... Uh, you know, that, you know, that basic adjustment of the Firearms Act ever since, and we all know that is just the tip of the iceberg. So when the, uh, the Conservatives say that, yes, we are going to get rid of Bill C-71, well, of course, I expect them to do that, but that just takes us back to a state where, where things were not good, and they're still not good. And the reason we're being threatened now is because that, that statist legislation, uh, the Firearms Act, still exists, and if we don't start reforming that fundamentally, this will come again and come back to haunt us again in another election cycle. So it, it's important that we do get the, uh, the conservatives into government, but that's not where our work ends. 
our work ends in lobbying them and helping them to reform the whole structure and, and refocusing the whole, whole thing away from us as just gun owners to the people who are misusing them. Of course, that brings us to this year, uh, Bill, or, um, <clears throat> we already talked about the uh, Bill C-71, uh, which expanded the belt background, the belt background checks beyond five years, um, which is um, disconcerting to a lot of different people. I mean, people change, right? You know, when you're younger, you know, you do crazy things, and yeah, you get caught and you get punished, and uh, you do your time or whatever it is, and you're, you know, a legal citizen again. Well. This could conceivably go back 20 years, and if you have an assault record, or, or if you've done some kind of slandering or, or something like that, even on social media, they will not renew your patent. Right? Crazy stuff, right? And, and this is all by design, right? This is not an unintended consequence. This is, this is what they want to do. They want to limit the amount of people that have firearms, right? So this is a plan, right? It's an incremental one. We, we all know now that. The Firearms Act was instituted, you know, it was basically a carbon copy of what happened in the UK, where they hoisted civil disarmament on these people right away and the guns disappeared. But the Canadians, um, there's strong civil uh, resistance and they had to slow it down and now they're doing it by a thousand cuts, right? Taking this, regulating that, and basically ushering in civil disarmament slowly. Well, it's, a, it's about to change with the Liberals. And Dave already alluded to that. <coughs> they want to make a massive leap in terms of taking guns. <clears throat> so as you can see, like um, just a little recap with the laws here, as you can see that you know Canada's had a long history of um, instituting gun controls, and for the most part, the population has accepted it. Right? Um, it's a it was a regular occurring ph phenomenon, and it's it's part of our culture. You know it makes us different from the states. They have a different experience than we do, okay? That doesn't mean it's right. It's just the way things are here, right? So we're basically at a state now we're recognized internationally as a restrictive firearms uh, country, right? So unlike the states and some other ones, but we're not as restrictive as, you know, some countries where they banned firearms altogether and we all know where that goes. So where are we with uh, the state of mind of the law-abiding Firearms owner. Well, you know, with all this, all these, all this legislation and regulation piling up, and really not um, doing what it was supposed to do, but only just treating us unjustly. Um, there, there's a lot of people out there that are very frustrated. They're fearful, as Dave was saying, and you know, they think that ultimately, in the end, the goal is to um, take away all the firearms. And I think everybody, everybody believes that's kind of what's going to be happening. So as a result, what's happened is that the uh, never in the history of Canada have we seen the firearms community um, galvanize and organize so much as they have now. You know, we have strong gun orgs out there that are growing. You know, we're we're flush with members, we're flush with cash. You know, we're we're agitating, we're organizing, and we're we're having some impact. We're embedded. Um, just to sort of backtrack for a second, myself, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I'm heavily um, embedded with the Conservatives, for instance. You know, I've, be, I've been on the board of uh, the Electoral District boards of, of Halton, and then when it split up into uh, Milton and Oakville near Burlington, and also I've, I've been in Burlington as well too, so I've, I've made a lot of contacts with the people that are the shakers and movers within that, within that party, and the whole idea is to have access, right? Like it's one thing to, you know, you know bark through the window at somebody, but you know, I know these people and they know me, right? Like for instance, when I, you know, when I go to the Lisa, Lisa Rates meetings, right? She always, she's talking about something or another. There's always a Q&A after. And uh, I always put up my hand. She goes, oh, Charlie, goes, what kind of gun question do you have for me today? Because she knows, right? And that's the whole idea, right? We have to have a gunny in front of these people all the time so they understand that this is a, it, it's, a, it's, a it's an issue that's not going away. We're right there, right? We're helping you, but we're beholding for what we do for you in terms of what you give us. So here we are today on the verge of another federal election, still being scapegoated by the politicians, you know, who shamelessly are pandering for the, you know, the votes of, you know, irrational voters. And um, 
So basically, you know, as David's already outlined, you know, the, the, the greatest threat that we have here now from the political parties is the Liberal Party of Canada. Um, and like, like Dave was saying, you know, they want to ban the military style um, rifles and we don't, they don't even know what that is. Uh, a funny little story, I'm really badgering Pam Damoff. I know that everybody knows who that is. And uh, through the NFA, because I'm an I'm a executive director on the NFA as well too, uh, a while back we had a little uh, membership drive where you could win a, uh, a gun if you, if you became a member, right? So I said, well, you know, the liberals keep talking about assault rifles. Let's give away an assault rifle, right? So we gave away a copy of a Schirmgewehre in 22. Well, doesn't Pam take the bait, right? And basically starts poo-pooing the NFA saying that, look what these people are doing. They're throwing these military assault rifles into the, into the market and God help us and, you know, God help our children, right? Everybody starts clamming in and going to say, you know, it's a 22, Pam. You don't know what you're talking about. And, well, finally, I was banned. <laughs> you know, but it, it, what it shows you is that the, um, the ignorance of the politician out there, right? Um, I, like, and she's a sweet woman. I've talked to her many times. You know, I, I'd invite her for dinner, you know, at my house, no problem. But uh, she's a little bit of a sickle fan, right? So she's, you know, parroting the, uh, you know, the party line and doesn't really read too much into you know, the policy behind what's, what they're actually saying and just goes along with it and goes silent when you challenge it or ban you, as in my case. So Dave already alluded on this already as well, too. We are at a crucial time. Okay, this, this is not funny. Um, there may not be a second chance to do this. Um, if, if we don't get the conservatives elected into a majority, all the other different options that could come together here are, are, don't bode well for us, right? We know that we've got targets on our back. This has become a great um, election issue. I mean, the liberals are doubling down on the gun, the gun policy thing. I just received this in the mail today, right? So, you know, I'm sure everybody's got a couple of these guns in the back here, right? They're, they continue the fear monger, right? So this, this issue, if anything, will be, the rhetoric of this will be even increased after the election. So I was, going, I was going to look at the scenario on my own terms, um, what's the best kind of scenario that would come out of this thing, but um, uh, is anybody familiar with the gunblog.ca? Um, Nick Johnson, who's a friend of mine, writes great stuff, very poignant things, puts a lot of thought into his thing. So uh, I talked to him and he's gi given me permission to basically hijack his article. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to speak to that. Uh, I, I agree with most of it. Um, I, I'm kind of... I'm going to sort of massage it a little bit according to my experience from the political side, so just bear with me. So um, Nick sees uh, four different scenarios that could play out. There's the Liberals win a majority, the Liberals win a minority, the Conservatives win a minority, or the Conservatives win a majority. So those are the four probable outcomes that may happen here. So here's the analysis, basically going from, from worst to the best scenario. So the the first one would be liberals win a majority, worst possible outcome, right? They're just going to go ahead and do exactly what they promised and, you know, all semi-automatics and handguns will disappear and this clubhouse will probably close down, tack time will be no more and, you know, we're going to be, you know, shooting with probably, you know, bolt action, whatever, in the end and even that won't be safe in the end, right? So. Now, on the upside, um, we know, and I know this from uh, the CPC headquarters, they're also doing polling, right? And so are the liberals. And we have people in there that are leaking information back to us as well, too. So the CPC have basically discerned that the liberals already know that they cannot form a majority. They don't have the seats. They don't have the support, okay? And the liberals know it as well, too, because their own internal po polling verifies the same thing. So that's, that's why you've seen a, a tack now in their, in their rhetoric out there saying that they are, you know, interested in the coalition with, uh, you know, the, the NDP or, you know, the, the Green Party and everything else because they know that they can't do it on their own. 
So that's one scenario. Now, what, what happens if the liberals win a minority? Another bad outcome, right? So the, uh, basically the, the same situation where um, they'll all band together and they'll, they'll introduce a, a more stricter gun control and they'll push it through, right? So another bad scenario. So what happens if the conservatives win a, uh, a minority government? Once again, another fragile situation. We know that minority governments only exist at the grace of, of the, uh, um, the opposition parties that are out there. The first time they can't strike a deal, there'll be a vote of non-confidence or, or some other thing, and the party will go, go down, right? And we'll have to go through this whole cycle again. And who knows where that's gonna go. So of course, the, the, the ideal situation is that the conservatives win a majority. This is our best outcome, okay? It's the only safe way that we can um, hold on to our guns for now, okay? But once again, like I said, it's a temporary measure. We can't just sit on our hands and say, okay, fine, you know, the conservatives are in, you know, C-71 will be abolished. We need to get rid of the root of the threat, and that's the Firearms Act it needs to be reformed and redirected towards where it's supposed to go, and that's at the the miscreants out there who are misusing their firearms. So I guess what I'm gonna say next is it's gonna be kind of disparaging to um, you know gunnies out there that may not align with the conservative party values and principles and may be more aligned with the NDP or you know the, um, the People's Party of Canada, for instance, okay? Um, but uh, we, we can't really, if you vote for one of those fringe parties or the the, the smaller parties out there, you're really going to allow, uh, you know, more gun control into into the situation. So, I'm not telling you what to do. Everybody's got their own conscience, right? But strategically voting for the conservatives, some of you may have to hold your nose. Uh, I'm not 100% happy with the C the CPC either. Uh, there's a great quote quote from uh, Fred Delory that uh, I want to share. He goes, and we asked him, he goes. Uh, what do you think about the conservatives in terms of the, the, the gun community? He goes, well, it's something like this. He goes, they're, they're not our enemies, okay, like the liberals are, but they're not really our friends either. But that's what we got, right? So, you know, we, we're gonna have to align with them and then we'll have to work on them, you know, and our gun orgs out there, and that's why it's important for you to support them so that um, those gun orgs can go there and have some effect and have some impact. And as I mentioned before, the, the upside of this last scenario was that uh, the recent information I got was that the conservatives are actually polling that the conservatives can reach a majority, right? And the liberals know it, right? So that's why we see them zigging and zagging out there with this coalition idea. So that is our best outcome. So basically, just to conclude, um, the conservatives are, are the only party that are sympathetic to our plight, right? And they're the only ones that have a real chance of defeating liberals. So, once, as I said before, if you vote for the Libertarians, the PPC, or for any small election, you're gonna waste your vote, I mean, in terms of uh, protecting your gun rights. This is a make or break situation where we can't even squander one vote. Because we've had several ridings in the past that one by 2%, 3%, my own riding, one by 3%, it became a swing riding. It's leaning to conservative now, but you know that's because there was a lot of complacent voters out there that didn't vote, right? A lot of, a lot of people were um, disaffected as well, were disappointed and sat home and just watched the, you know, the, you know, the, the election happen on, on television and weren't participating directly. So, I urge you to get out there and vote. But in the meantime, um, actually, you know what? Let's just have a show of hands here. Who has, who has helped their local uh, CPC candidate in the room? Who's, who's helped their candidate in the room? The conservative candidates. Who's helped them in the last bit? So, so we got about uh, six or seven people out of 30, right? And, and, and this is the problem, right? 
So I urge you, we have a couple, we have a couple days left. If you haven't had an opportunity to even meet your, your candidate, go there, meet them physically, volunteer. There's lots of things to do. You can still do canvassing, right? You can do driving. driving. You can be on the phone. You can you know, put in some signs. You can prepare for a victory party, God willing, right? Um, there's all kinds of different things we can do. So this is your last chance. Don't be one of those voter or one of those gunnies out there that grumbles at the television and didn't vote. Because you've only got yourself to blame. And we'll be blaming you too later. <laughs> anyway, you know what? Um, that, that's more or less what I want to say. I just want to say that together we can prevail, right? And in the end, our civil resistance is not in vain. So I thank you for your time. Thank you.